please remember, we would like to have all of you sign up, even if you're not registered to take the class, because we would like to know uh, that we have a, plenty of people coming to these lectures. So today we have uh, a man uh, who is really working hard for his visiting, uh, for his visit to Cornell in this particular year. He's been here, I think, four t three times before, four times total. And he does things like buy books in the Friends of the Library sale, like 60 of them, in order to take home to Germany. You, if you want to share stories of old books in the book sale, you can do that. But uh, Vincenzo Rondinella is the head of the nuclear decommissioning department in the nuclear safety and security directorate of the joint research center at the european commission and he's spending about three years uh, three weeks here it may seem like three years three weeks here giving lectures on a variety of topics related to nuclear <coughs> fuel cycle nuclear fuels nuclear reactors nuclear safety here at cornell almost every day that he's here and so we welcome him to give us a talk today specifically on optimizing fuel performance and safety in advanced nuclear systems. There it is right there. Vincenzo. Thank you very much. Yes? Do you have a list somewhere of the other talks you're giving? A what? Uh, the other talks you're giving, do you have a list of them somewhere? Uh, yes, yes. But they are all posted in the respective uh, classes. Uh, yes, so this there are postings of all the previous talks, but they are in the nuclear science and engineering class and the nuclear module. So uh, if you would like to see some of the earlier talks, I guess you could send him. You'll you'd come to lunch and get arranged no. to send, have those other talks sent. Yes, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I will uh, start immediately. Uh, just uh, for you, Feel free to interrupt any time if you don't understand something or if I'm uh, too cryptic in, in what I'm saying. Um, I will try to give you a, a glance of uh, issues related to uh, nuclear energy systems, nuclear reactors, and in particular um, nuclear fuel and fuel cycle. I will um, start with some uh, uh, with recall of some background information and um, and then I will um, a little bit talk about the current uh, reactor systems uh, the light water uh, reactors and their fuels um, how we can improve the efficiency and especially how we, we can introduce elements of recycling uh, and optimization of the consumption of the material that we use to produce energy and then I will move into advanced uh, reactor system to try and um, highlight to you what you can do uh, if you want to achieve full recycling and uh, the highest uh, possible degree of uh, um, recuperation of the, of the material, which, brings which would bring nuclear energy very much into uh, high sustainability and uh, um, minimization of its uh, waste production. I will uh, therefore uh, mention some concepts related to the so-called uh, closed uh, nuclear fuel cycle. So let's start with some uh, background uh, uh, information and data. There are more or less 450 nuclear uh, power reactors uh, operating in the world. Um, there are many more if we count also research reactors. Roughly 11% of the electricity in the world is, uh, is produced. And in spite of the fact that, uh, uh, especially in the Western world, there are several plants that are going offline because they have reached their uh, end of life or because uh, it has been decided to shut them down, the total production of uh, electricity keeps increasing uh, year after year because there are some countries that build new ones and also because the efficiency of the existing plants uh, keep 
getting uh, optimized. Um, what you see in the in the bottom right uh, diagram is um, a clear indication that among the the uh, energy sources in terms of carbon emissions, uh, nuclear is at the level of the uh, of most of the renewables. Uh, so essentially, uh, it's a carbon-free or very low carbon type of energy source. In fact, in Europe and in USA, uh, nuclear is the main uh, low carbon energy source and is the second uh, worldwide. Another item I'd I like to, to recall is why nuclear energy is interesting, and that is exemplified uh, in this slide. Each fission event uh, uh, occurring in a, in, a, in a nuclear reactor generates 200 mega electron volts uh, corresponding to 10 to the minus 11 joules very tiny quantity, but if we compare it to the energy released by the combustion of a carbon uh, atom, um, it's uh, seven orders of magnitude uh, uh, higher. So we, we get a lot of energy very concentrated uh, per, per uh, event. This means that, uh, among other things, that we need less material and we generate less waste than traditional combustion uh, uh, energy sources. We need, uh, we consume roughly one ton of fissile uh, material per year to generate 1,000 megawatt uh, electric. And uh, as, an, as a comparison, we need to burn two million tons of carbon in one year to generate the same amount. Uh, of power and, and energy. The principle of nuclear energy is controlled chain reaction. We need to fission fissile nuclei. The conditions to achieve that in, uh, in a light water reactor, which is the typical reactor that generate electricity uh, in our countries uh, right now, is to slow down neutrons to the point that uh, the likelihood to have a fission when they see a nucleus of fissile material is very high. And this is done by the coolant of our reactors, by the water. Uh, you see in this diagram the fission cross-section, which is an indication of this uh, likelihood, as a function of the uh, neutron energy. The neutrons are emitted by fission in that blue range at high energy, and they need to be uh, slow down to maximize their uh, efficiency in terms of fission. Uh, so in order to have uh, a chain reaction, we need to have slow down neutrons, and we need to have enough fissile material in our reactor core. That's why we cannot use natural uranium. Uh, we need to increase the content of its uh, fissile fraction, which is the isotope uranium-235 uh, in the material. Another way to achieve a sustainable and controllable chain reaction is to have a very high flux of neutrons without moderation, so without slowing them down. This is the principle by which a so-called fast reactor operates. Fission and, uh, um, let's say, the process and the life of the fuel in the reactor induces uh, significant and uh, dramatic effects. Mostly uh, radiation damage and accumulation of uh, fission products are enormous drivers that alter the properties of the material. Um, the same uh, mechanism that generates the energy that we extract to produce electricity is also causing a lot of disruption in our crystal uh, lattice. Um, a fission event uh, generates two highly energetic fission fragments that uh, move inside the, uh, the crystal and lose energy by heating and interacting, stripping electrons out of neighboring atoms. 
uh, they generate 100,000 displa displacement each each of them. So 100,000 atoms are affected by each fission event, so that each atom in the fuel is displaced once every day during the life, uh, the operating life of the nuclear fuel. I mention this to indicate the type of solicitation the, the fuel material undergoes, uh, which are kind of uh, extreme. And uh, even after the end of the fission, there are still events that are depositing energy in the material, in particular the uh, radioactive decay of the short-lived species that uh, are generated by the fission. And this, this mechanism cause significant alteration in our fuel material. The other basic mechanism that causes change is the fact that these fission fragments constitute the nucleus of uh, new elements that are formed inside our uh, fuel. You see here the periodic table, the red highlighted uh, uh, elements are the most abundant fission products, but in fact most of the periodic table appears into our material with time. So we start with the well-characterized material. In order to extract energy, this material changes significantly. You see here the abundances of the most frequent uh, fission products. And what is important is that uh, if the radiation damage displaces uh, atoms, the formation of new elements causes uh, trouble in terms of the chemistry and in terms also of the uh, interatomic uh, uh, bonds because many of the fission products can accommodate in the fluorite uh, lattice of U2 but some of them have relatively low solubility so they tend to separate and form precipitated phases either oxides or metallic and some of them are highly mobile and uh, tend to be released from the fuel or to accumulate at the coldest parts in the fuel uh, uh, environment. Some of these volatiles are even noble gases which do not react with any element and so they essentially cause the material to swell or they try to find a way to be released from the fuel material. Another basic mechanism that uh, occurs during irradiation in the reactor is the fact that by absorbing neutrons, not all the nuclei um, split and fission. There, is, uh, there are processes by which, by absorbing neutron, the actual weight of the original nucleus increases, and by uh, radioactive decay, this nucleus can become the nucleus of a different element. And so, starting from uranium, you can form Neptunium, americium, Neptunium, plutonium, americium, curium, and uh, the so-called uh, minor actinides. These are elements that do not exist in nature because they have all decayed away from the, uh, the big events that generated uh, the stars and the planets, but they are formed in the nuclear reactor. And many of these have long half-lives. They are radioactive and radiotoxic, and so we need to take care of them uh, uh, when we manage the spent fuel. Some of these, like the plutonium, however, are fissile and so they can be reused as fuel. So this is an important fact. Uh, at the same time that we consume our uh, fissile component in the fuel, we are also generating new fissile materials. So this was the a quick recall of basic uh, concepts and this is an attempt at representing the nuclear fuel cycle. We start with natural resources, uh, mining of uranium. Um, uranium is present in, the, in our planet in uh, various abundances, typically is not very abundant so you need a lot of raw minerals to extract uh, the uranium and then it's uh, fabricated into ceramic pellets that are irradiated. And after the irradiation, there is the big uh, dilemma. Is the spent fuel a waste form that should go to a geologic repository and be sequestered forever from the biosphere? Or should we 
try and recuperate the components of the material that can still be used as fuel and do some kind of recycling of reprocessing and re-inject the recuperated material into the fuel fabrication. I will try a little bit to talk about this uh, today. So I said that the reactors that are in operation today, the commercial reactors that are in operation today, are thermal reactors, are those that slow down the neutrons to uh, have the sustain, sustainable uh, chain react, reaction. And there are certain things that we can do with them in terms of uh, optimizing the efficiency and introducing some recycling uh, component. First, the, the general material flow to give you an idea of how the, uh, the influx of the raw material uh, works. So you start with, um, as I said, relatively large amounts of raw minerals. You extract uranium as an oxide, then you convert it into hexafluoride. This form, it's easy to handle because it can be solid at room temperature, but it uh, becomes a gas very soon by heating it up. And uh, uh, that allows enrichment in the fissile fraction. And so finally, the, the important element is that on a 1,000 megawatt electric uh, nuclear power station that uses uranium enriched to 4% to generate uh, electricity and uh, extracts an energy corresponding to 45 gigawatt day per ton uh, of uh, uh, metal, um, you need every year 27 tons of U2, fresh U2, and you generate the equivalent of 27 tons of uh, spent fuel. This is the indication of the material flow in a typical reactor. Of course, if you increase the burn up and or the enrichment, you can reduce the, the yearly need of material. Or if you introduce some recycling, you can also uh, improve, further improve this uh, material flow. As I said, the fuel is com constituted by ceramic pellets. Typical diameter is eight, nine millimeters. These are stacked inside a metallic tube made of a zirconium-based alloy. A zirconium alloys are very good because they are transparent to neutrons. They don't remove neutrons from our chain reactors, chain reaction. Uh, the fuel rods are four meters long. Typically, they are bundled together into fuel assemblies that are then loaded under water in the core uh, of the nuclear reactor. There are two types of uh, light water reactor in use. Uh, most important ones, the pressurized water reactor and the boiling water reactor. The pressurized water reactor uses pressurized water to go through the core and remove the heat from the fuel, the water then exchanges heat in an intermediate uh, heat exchanger uh, with other water, which goes to the turbine to uh, generate uh, the mechanical uh, energy that then becomes uh, electrical uh, uh, energy. And uh, uh, the typical configuration is indicated there at the top. You have in the core of a pressurized water reactor, typically 80 to 100 tons of uranium organized into um, 150 to 250 of fuel rod bundles uh, that are inside the core, which is here. In the case of uh, the boiling water reactor, uh, you don't have an intermediate uh, uh, loop. You introduce your coolant in the core. The, the water is pressurized, but it is allowed to boil. And by boiling in the core, it also controls the power uh, of the reactor. And then on the, above the core, there is a steam separator. And the steam goes directly to the turbines. So there is no intermediate loop. The core of the boiling water reactor is bigger than the one of the uh, pressurized water reactor. There is roughly 140 tons of uranium, 
and uh, 750 fuel bundles inside. And um, these are the basic types of react. By the way, Fukushima type of reactor was where uh, boiling water uh, reactors. Um, these are man-made uh, reactors, but there, there are several other types. And one that I need to mention is the non-man-made uh, nuclear reactor. Uh, nuclear reactors existed, natural nuclear reactors existed on our planet a couple of billion years ago, because at that time, the fissile content of natural uranium was higher than today. Today is 0.7%. At that time, was close to 3%. And that is enough to have a sustained chain reaction with uh, light water. And so there are some uh, areas in, in various countries. This is the in Gabon in Africa. But there are, there are also in Canada, in Australia, where uh, a few billion years ago, we had naturally occurring chain reactions which went on and off locally, depending on how much water was present. So when it was raining, they were on, and then they would shut down when the water would disappear. And they kept operating for several hundred thousand years. No engineered uh, systems, no uh, control. This is amazing, and this also, besides the, 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 the general fascination, these sites are extremely important because the scientists, um, by looking at uh, how far the remnants, the daughters of the decay of all the radioactive uh, material uh, species generated during the irradiation, have traveled away from, the, from where the core was, they can get an indication of uh, the migration properties of different uh, rocks, and in particular, the rock system uh, near these sites. And this is very important when designing a geologic repository, which is a place that we want to retard as much as possible the migration of uh, radionuclides that might be released uh, from, the, from the waste. The good news is that most of these sites, in most of these sites, you can find these remnants, these daughters of uh, decay, um, just a few meters away from where the actual chain reaction was taking place, which is extremely good news. It means that you can indeed uh, identify some rock type that are well suited for a possible future geologic repository. Now, moving to the fuel, I said that radiation damage and uh, accumulation of fission products uh, case cause a lot of changes in the material. These are compounded by, by the fact that uh, um, the fission in the pellet of uh, the nuclear fuel does not occur homogeneously. And the irradiation conditions are not at all homogeneous. The UO2 is a ceramic, and so tends to be a refractory, which means that uh, in the, along the radius of the pellet, you have quite a significant temperature gradient, which can change depending on how the power regime is, uh, is regulated. Um, at the same time, the fission density is not the same along the radius of the pellet. You tend to have many more fissions at the periphery of the fuel pellet, because there you form a lot of plutonium by this process of absorption of neutron and uh, decay into heavier species. So locally, at the rim of the fuel pellet, you have higher the equivalent of a higher enrichment. And so you have a material that starts as a very well controlled and characterized uh, low impurity, uh, tight uh, dimensions, uh, its, uh, its life. And then it starts accumulating new elements. It, its atoms get disrupted. They get moved at least once every day. And even more, it operates under this kind of uh, non-homogeneous condition. As a result, the fuel uh, becomes first becomes very heterogeneous, because at the end of irradiation, this, this region of the pellet is very different from the center. And uh, you have any sort of 
macroscopic and microscopic alteration. This is the original fuel bundle. You can tell at the beginning all the fuel rods are nice, nicely aligned, same dimensions. At the end they have axially deformed, they have elongated, but in a stochastic way, not in a homogeneous way. Um, the fuel itself undergoes, uh, during its life, undergoes many changes. It starts by shrinking and cracking, and then it keeps cracking, but it expands and starts pushing against uh, uh, the rod. And if you go down to lower uh, scale, it, it even undergoes major structural reorganization and restructuring. You see there in the two pictures, at the same magnification, the fuel morphology before irradiation and after very high burn up, uh, after very high fission density uh, accumulation. So it's a, the, with the existing systems, we have uh, uh, quite a challenging environment. And uh, we have, uh, in any case, since we are talking about optimization, we have several trends that are uh, affecting the evolution of these systems. On the general scale, there is an attempt at uh, optimizing the use of the resources. For example, by um, reducing the amount of raw material needed to fabricate uh, the fuel. And then there are new types of uh, reactors and new types of fuel that are uh, considered. After Fukushima, the concept of accident tolerant fuel was introduced and the major research organization and also the industry were asked to look into that. So how to develop a fuel concept that allows, in case of an accident, to um, allows the operator to have longer time to react and try to fix the, the problem as opposed to the way uh, it, is, it is now. And so there, is, there are intensive and, and diverse uh, lines of development which are already at the stage of uh, tests in reactor of new fuel concepts that should allow uh, to have several hours, for example, uh, in which before the fuel starts being degraded, if you lose the cooling of the core of your reactor. And something, let's say an evolution of the current type of reactor is the small modular reactor, which is the idea instead of building big uh, high power, like 1,600 uh, megawatt uh, uh, power uh, cores to build smaller modular uh, reactors. So instead of one by 1,000, maybe two or three by 200, 300 megawatt, the advantage would be that, first of all, you would not have to build them on site. You could build them in a factory on a, in a standardized modular way and then bring them where you need them. You could have many at the same site and so you could sort of modulate your energy output, which would match well the fact that in the energy mix you are going to have intermittent uh, producing uh, renewable sources. Or you could, you could bring this type of modular reactor in remote locations where you don't need a huge power grid, but nevertheless you need electricity. And so you could power locally uh, towns or bases or, or or maybe you could use these type of facilities to generate process heat for industrial uh, uh, activities. So these are all developments that are in a sense evolutionary. Um, but the other big uh, line of development has to do with the recycling. And so the way the spent fuel is handled in many countries, including in, uh, in this country, is direct disposal. So the fuel uh, is considered the waste after irradiation and is sent to eventually to a geologic repository. There is no geologic repository in operation for spent fuel. So in fact, the fuel is stored for a very long time. And there are some advantages to this option. 
the back end of the fuel cycle is simplified. You don't need to do anything on the fuel, no more conditioning. You don't have risks of proliferation in the sense that the plutonium and the fissile material is embedded inside a very radioactive substance. So if you want, you can still maybe spend fuel, but it's very difficult to handle and very difficult to reprocess to extract the fissile. But there is another way of looking at it. In the fuel, you start with maybe 4% uranium-235. And at the end of irradiation, after having produced 40,000 mega a day per ton, you still have 1% of the uranium-235. You have 1% of the plutonium that you have formed by these absorption processes. And you still have 93% of your uranium-238. So the idea is, shouldn't we try to recuperate this fraction of the spent fuel and reuse it? Just by doing a single plutonium recycling, we could gain 25, 30% energy, and uh, we would improve the sustainability, and we would generate a reduction of the waste uh, volume that has to go to the high-level waste uh, repository. In fact, this technology exists and is already in operation industrially. So today, the back end of the fuel cycle looks like this. Either the spent fuel after cooling and storage goes to the repository, or after cooling it goes, after short cooling, it goes to the reprocessing facility and get recycled by removing plutonium and uranium and using them to refabricate fuel that then goes back to the, to the reactor. There is still high-level waste generated. The minor actinides, the fission products are vitrified and they have to go also to the geologic repository, but the amount is roughly one-fifth of the spent fuel uh, uh, content. So as I said, this this is already uh, reality. There are reprocessing facilities in operation, in particular in France. There is a, a reprocessing facility that uh, recycles uranium and plutonium since uh, a couple of decades. In Japan, that is, there is one ready to start. And then there are others in Russia, in India, in China um, that are also at various level of implementation. But there is a problem with using the MOX, the mixed oxide fuel, so the fuel in which you put the plutonium separated. And uh, the basic problem is you can burn this fuel only once. So at the end, you still have some plutonium in your spent fuel after the, having put the MOX in the reactor. But you cannot put it, separate it again and put it back, because the fissile content has become too low to be usable in one of the light water existing reactor. The result is that at the end you start with spent UO2 fuel, you recycle it, then you have spent MOX fuel uh, that you cannot recycle any further. And so this spent MOX fuel accumulates and then it would have to go uh, to, to the repository unless we fully close the fuel cycle. But to do that, we need a different type of reactors. We need the fast uh, breeding reactors. And uh, a fast breeding reactor is a type of reactor that uses the neutrons as they are emitted by the fission uh, process. So there is no, uh, there is no um, moderation and no slowing down of the neutrons. But if you remember, to have a, a sustained, uh, controlled uh, chain reaction with fast neutrons, you need to have a lot of uh, neutrons. You need to have a very high neutronic flux. To have a high neutronic flux, you need to have very high enrichment. And so the fuel in a fast reactor must contain maybe 20% of fissile uh, content. And since you don't have to slow down your neutrons, you don't want to lose them, so everything is compacted together. And the core of a fast reactor is relatively small. It's much smaller than the core of a 
boiling water reactor, for example. This implies that to remove a huge amount of heat in a very small volume, uh, you need to use very efficient uh, cooling systems. You cannot use water, for example. And so typically what is proposed to be used is uh, liquid metal. And among the liquid metals, liquid sodium is the best. Uh, and now, liquid sodium is reactive with air, with humidity, and with water. So it has to be kept in under inert conditions. So it's inertized. There is an inert gas on every free surface of sodium. But it does not need to be pressurized. It, it has a very high heat exchange efficiency. So it can work essentially at uh, atmospheric uh, pressure. The temperatures in the core are higher than in the light water reactors. And the control of the fast reactors is a little bit like uh, dealing with a very sportive car as opposed to a family car. It becomes, if you allow me this uh, metaphor, uh, it becomes more complicated. It's still possible, but it requires additional uh, control systems. But the good things that you can obtain with this type of reactors are essentially two. Uh, the first one, which is really fascinating, is that you can generate in your fuel more fissile material than you consume. So each fission event produces more than one neutron, uh, one to five neutrons in general, average is around three. And so if you design your core in a way that you, uh, you use one of the neutrons generated to do a new fission, and uh, you use at least one of the other ones to generate plutonium or another fissile species, uh, you can actually arrive to the point that you have your core in which you have one neutron that generates a new fission and more than one neutron they generate new fissile. And so you can have, at the end, in your spent fuel, more fuel than when you started. And this is a fascinating uh, perspective. Now, this is demonstrated. Uh, there have been reactors working with this concept. And not just research reactor. This super phoenix reactor at the power of 1,200 megawatt electric. So this was a prototype commercial uh, reactor. And it worked quite well. It was shut down due to political uh, uh, decisions. But this clearly demonstrates that such a goal is, is achievable. Of course, uh, as I said, no. um, a fast reactor is, is like a sport sportive car and so the fuel for example is exposed to conditions that are even more extreme than the fuel of the light water reactor. In fact the diameter of the fuel pellet is much smaller because it has to undergo very steep temperature gradient. So steep that the central temperature of the fuel pellet reaches level at which uh, the accumulation of uh, voids causes the formation of a central hole. After a few minutes, in the center of the pellet, the, a hole is formed. And uh, I want to mention another reactor. This is a research reactor that operated in Idaho for uh, several decades to mention, to introduce the other great advantage of, uh, of the fast reactor. Um, in this reactor, the EBR2, uh, metallic fuel was uh, irradiated and uh, in addition to the uh, breeding and to the uh, generation of new fuel, what you could do in this reactor was to incorporate waste inside the new fuel that you would put in your reactor. And you would be able to do that because you would have a, a, a reprocessing facility attached to the reactor itself. And now this facility is used to prepare and condition the, the fuel from the reactor that has been shut down for good for a disposal. Uh, and uh, 
what do you do if you do that? Well, the consequence is that if the red curve represents the, the radiotoxicity of uh, high-level waste or spent fuel, um, you see that it takes 130,000 years to, go b to decay back to the level corresponding of a natural uranium uh, mine. But if we remove from that total the minor actinides and the long-lived fission products, we can reduce this time down to something of the order of 1,000 years, or in the best case, maybe 5, 000, 500 years. And this is a time much shorter than 130,000. 500 years is something for which engineers can design uh, manufacts. So the, the fast reactors would allow us to breed and to produce more fuel than consume, but also to destroy the most negative component of the uh, high-level waste uh, generated. And you could do this also with multi-recycling. Multi Another effect of this would be that is exemplified here. These are the footprints of the geologic repository for the waste for different type of reactors. And uh, in terms of uranium consumption, gallery length, maximum dose, uh, etc. And you see that if you go to fast reactors, you have a significant reduction of this uh, footprint. Now, how, how do you do that? You need to do two things. Partition the spent fuel into its components, the reusable ones and the real waste, and uh, transmute these components that you want to destroy by reincorporating them into new fuel. The partitioning is done with advanced reprocessing, chemical reprocessing methods, and the variety has been developed. I don't go into details, but uh, all, this includes also some, uh, some concepts in which you separate the fissile together with the waste, and this is, gives a very positive advantage in terms of safeguards because, again, all the material that could be used for uh, bad uh, uh, purposes is mixed with very nasty radioactive species that make its, its uh, diversion very difficult. And again, this also has been demonstrated, and I want to cite two examples. This is the superfat experiment in which oxide fuel was fabricated at our labs, containing minor actinides, was sent to the Phoenix reactor in France in, uh, of CA, and then the, the irradiated fuel came back to our hot cells for post-irradiation examination and for reprocessing to simulate a re multiple recycling. And it worked. The, the fuel was irradiated. By the way, this is the central hole that I mentioned. It happens at high pressure. Different concept in which you had a little bit of species to destroy together with the actual fuel, or you had a lot of fraction to destroy in uh, fuel rods not to be used as fuel, were irradiated to decent burn-ups, they were reprocessed. So the demonstration of this type of approach exists. And this is another case. It's the same thing, but in this case we used metallic fuel, and this was done in collaboration with the uh, Japanese uh, research organization. And also in this case, we did not find any uh, negative behavior that would uh, compromise the use of the material. Now, before concluding, I need to mention that, uh, of course, I, I had to select some cases and some examples, but there are huge efforts worldwide to find, uh, to develop together uh, in, among interested uh, parties, future system. And this is the scheme of the Generation 4 uh, initiative, is a consortium of, uh, is a forum of uh, many countries. It was initiated by DOE here in the, in the US. And the idea is to develop future systems having in mind as main parameters the sustainability the waste minimization, and in general, the innovation and the, and the safety. 
There is the sodium cooled fast reactor, lead cooled fast reactor, gas cooled fast reactor, supercritical water uh, reactor, a very high temperature reactor, and the molten salt reactor. So, as final uh, message, uh, I want to say that a lot of thinking has been put into how to fully use the, the nuclear fuel as a resource and how to fully introduce sustainability and, uh, and uh, full efficiency into the system. And so many schemes are proposed starting from what is going on now with the light water reactor, adding some fast reactors to the light water reactor, going all the way down to only fast reactors that do everything, generate the fuel, generate electricity, and burn their own fuel. Um, and so the, most of these, or at least many of these, have been even demonstrated at laboratory scale or even at prototype uh, scale. But the only way to implement them is by developing nuclear energy as one of the sources that we need to have in our mix if we want to decarb decarbonize our uh, societies. And with this, I will stop. Thank you for your attention. And I hope it was not too, too boring. Thank you. And we do have time for questions. So let's ask some questions. Yes. Uh, what is sort of the main uh, blockage for getting free reactors uh, in use? And it seems quite such a great idea. The main blockage. Um, well, I would say that the main blockage is political. Political in the sense that um, if you want to develop this type of uh, systems, you need to decide that you want to go for it. Because at the beginning, you need to invest a lot of money into that. Um, so that is the that is. First and foremost, and this being a political decision, this is something that has to be done by our representatives. Uh, so they have to be made aware that this is something that, that we would like or we would be interested in. And uh, technically, there are also some, some issues, for example, issues related to the multi-recycling and issues related to the efficiency of the separation. Because there is always a little bit of loss that remains uh, when you do the chemical separation of the different species. And so those are areas in which there is some work that is needed to fully optimize uh, the processes. Um, otherwise, it, it, it's simply a matter of essentially continuing on the results that have already been uh, obtained. I welcome very much the fact that uh, it looks like um, in this country, a new fast reactor for test irradiation will seems that will be built, because at the moment, all the fast reactors used to do these experiments that I mentioned have all shut down. And the only place, if you want to test a fast reactor fuel or a, or a new concept, the only places where you can do that are in Russia, in China. Uh, it's not particularly good. I think we should take. Uh, we should have a pl places in in the U.S. or in Europe or in Japan where we can uh, uh, where we can do that. Um, and the the other point, if you want, is the time. Uh, this this type of developments, I tried in 45 minutes to 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 summarize things that in some cases took decades to be to be achieved. So. It's, uh, it's a strange feeling, but uh, most of the programs in which I'm involved now will be completed and will be achieved uh, uh, after I will be retired. So it's, we, we tend of liking to see the, 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 uh, the success or the failure, more the success of what we do within our uh, lifetime. But here we are talking about programs that will go into the second half of the century and even even further. In the United States, we don't reprocess because of a decision made by Jimmy Carter. Yeah. 
uh, a fellow nuclear engineer. Ago. Yeah. So French made the, the French made the opposite decision. Yes, but the but the French um, the French are reprocessing their fuel and they are burning MOX. Uh, many in Europe, 30 reactors are burning MOX. But that is done, and that makes sense if you want to go all the way to close the cycle. Because as I said, uh, it's better to have spent UO2 fuel as waste than spent MOX as waste. But if you burn the MOX as a bridge, waiting to have the fast reactor to continue with the recycling, then it makes a lot of sense. France has this in mind in the long term, but right now they are undergoing some turmoils internally, and so they have recently postponed the building of the next uh, fast uh, prototype reactor that was supposed to take place in the next uh, decade. Now they say they will do it in 2050, which means I think they will be stuck with a lot of uh, spent mocks uh, waiting for, uh, for these new solutions to become available. Okay, let us say thank you again and <laughs> we have the sign-in sheet and we have those of you going to lunch.